By midsummer, researchers had come up with a vaccine, but it would take months to make enough to safely inoculate a nation. And it was still many weeks away from delivery when students returned to school in the fall and the feared second wave hit. Well, two schools in Vacaville have decided to close their doors until next week because of fresh concerns about the H1N1 flu virus. By mid-November, H1N1 hospitalizations and deaths were growing at a terrifying rate. During the roughly five-month period of the first wave, 2,000 Californians were hospitalized with H1N1 infections. 200 died. But the second wave was a different story. In just two months, 4,600 were hospitalized. 230 died. We saw people hospitalized uh, and we saw people die. Every time you see that as a public health professional, you are very, very worried. You are struck by the fact that this could go on indefinitely. By early November, the vaccine was finally made available, but in a very limited supply. We were anticipating that by the 1st of November, uh, we would have received 6 million doses of vaccine here in, in California. Uh, by that date, uh, we only received 2 million doses. Meaning the vaccine, expected for months, was first provided to those who fell into a high-risk category, while the state waited for additional doses. It's one thing for me to sit in my office and study the epidemiology and say, okay, well, this is perfectly rational. Immunize these people, don't immunize those people. For the health department staff and the physicians and nurses in the community who had actually to say to people, no, you're not in the priority group, I'm not going to give you the vaccine. It was very difficult, very difficult. One of those that wasn't able to get the vaccine was Alicia Contreras of San Diego. In early November, Contreras' partner, Dana Harwood, noticed something was seriously wrong. I came home on Tuesday after work and she was just laying on the couch with the lights off and no TV on, no music on, which was very unusual. Harwood took Contreras to the hospital and within hours, she was in the ICU on life support. I was nervous because I thought, okay, now we're in the hospital, now she'll get better and she wasn't getting better at all. They were you know, 99% sure that she wouldn't make it out of the hospital. Dr. Bayan Landa, the infectious disease specialist at San Diego's Scripps Mercy Hospital, was finally brought in to evaluate Contreras. Normally, when we take a chest x-ray, the x-rays pass through the tissue and then they make an imprint on the plaque behind. And we can see enough air, that's how we can tell where it's in the lung. In, in Alicia's case, her lungs became what we called whited out. They were completely filled with fluid. Every single little air sac was filled with fluid. And so the x-ray could not penetrate through. It was white. The whole thing was white. This was why we expected her to not improve. And while Contreras had wanted the vaccine, there were many Californians who did not. Educated and affluent, they believed the inoculations carried harmful toxins and intentionally avoided getting the shot. One of those was marriage and family counselor Michael Burgess of Paso Robles. Since turning 50, Burgess had been focused on his health, eating well, working out, hadn't been sick in years, until mid-November when he came down with a persistent cough. And then he started to get a rattle in his chest and that really scared me. Burgess was taken to the hospital where his condition worsened by the hour until, like Contreras, he was in a coma, kept alive by a machine. His condition got worse and worse and worse. The lungs went into something called ARDS where the lungs stiffen and go solid and it has a very high mortality rate. And I gave him up and I said, you know, if you have to go, Michael, if you have to go, it's okay. By the end of December, more than 500 Californians had died from the H1N1 virus, but the state was finally receiving its full allotment of the vaccine. And as millions were inoculated, the number of hospitalizations and deaths from the disease dramatically declined. None of this, though, was of any help to the thousands already infected. By early December, Alicia Contreras had been in ICU for more than a month and given just days to live. I, I was trying to understand why is it that some people are unable to control this virus? Why can't they 
fight off the virus with their own immune system. Then Dr. Bayan Landa discovered a curious thing about the H1N1 virus. It was attacking the body's ability to produce interferon, a protein that helps the immune system fight pathogens. So basically I was thinking maybe one of these patients are in an interferon deficient state. Maybe if we give them the interferon, maybe they'll respond. As a final gamble, Contreras was put on interferon and immediately her body responded. I was elated. I was absolutely elated because quite honestly I, I was expecting her to not make it. So come on guys, let's go out for a walk. Let's go. For Contreras, there is little she remembers of her weeks in ICU. I recall thinking to myself, I'm so tired. If I were to die, it would be okay. The hard part for her has been the months of recovery. It was such a struggle. I mean, because I had been on my back for six weeks without moving, without walking, without doing anything at all. And I remember it was, it was exhausting just to sit myself up in the bed. Simple things like brushing my teeth were absolutely exhausting. Um, watching television was exhausting. But then I began to realize, well, you know what? I just need to suck it up a little bit and I need to get down to business and I need to start working. About that time in late January, Michael Burgess began to recover and slowly emerge from his sedation. Waking up in the hospital, in a, in a hospital bed with a bunch of tubes coming out of my arms and 34 days had elapsed. I was just in complete shock. How did I end up in the hospital and what happened to me? Burgess was told he had caught the H1N1 virus more than a month earlier, that it had almost killed him and his body was now transformed. I could hardly move because all of my muscles had atrophied. It was very hard for me to even turn myself over in bed. And I remember looking at my leg and my calf muscle and it was hanging down as if from a string. I had the body of a 11 year old boy. My body had simply shrunk. And there was another problem. The swine flu uh, thickened my blood and caused me to have a stroke. With your hand, there we go. Once an active runner and weightlifter, Burgess now needs help simply to walk. Three times a week, his wife drives him 30 miles to San Luis Obispo for physical therapy. And this is just to get you loose. Oh, this uh, is the arm thing. Speed. Yep. Oh, that's right. I want to keep it fairly high. In retrospect, when I think about the things in my life that I insure, you know, my car, my home, because they're so important to me, they're such a big investment. I've got to insure them. But what's my biggest investment is my life, my health. And the fact that I didn't take out an insurance policy, like a simple vaccine. I, I think, oh, I can't believe I did that. That's the that's basic thing I would do. It's my life, it's my health. There's this little insurance policy I can take. It's just, it's just one shot and I'm immune from the swine flu. Thanks, sweetie. Vaccination is critical in terms of prevention and it's critical for you as an individual and it's critical for the community at large. It's an issue of social responsibility to a large degree. Because it breaks the chain of transmission and enough people have obtained immunity through inoculations and infections that the virus is now being held in check. And on the 10th of August, 2010, the World Health Organization declared the H1N1 pandemic was finally over. We are now moving into the post-pandemic period. The new H1N1 virus has largely run its course. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that 60 million Americans have been infected with the H1N1 virus, 270,000 hospitalized, more than 12,000 died. Close to 11,000 were under the age of 65, triple the number that typically succumbs to the seasonal flu. 
The disproportionate impact on very young children. By far the highest in a percentage of hospitalizations were in kids under one year of age. There were many more deaths and severe illnesses in young children than we typically see during seasonal flu. I think overall uh, we feel that this was a moderately severe pandemic and warranted all the steps that we took to, uh, to try to protect the, the population as we move forward. We took ourselves to the brink of being able to respond. It could have been devastating to our entire public health infrastructure, not only locally, but nationwide. The virus, however, is still out there. It hasn't gone away. So the public will continue to be inoculated. The seasonal flu vaccine now also protects against H1N1. The concern is that in a Darwinian effort to survive, the H1N1 virus could once again evolve. Our own laboratory here in California has been routinely testing a subset of the samples that have come in uh, to test for antiviral uh, sensitivity as the earliest sign that there's been a genetic change uh, in the virus. And we send those on a CDC to sequence and make sure that the virus hasn't mutated because that's a big concern. It's going to mutate a lot. It's going to mutate. Influenza virus, the hallmark is that it changes annually. When we look at the uh, our experience uh, with previous uh, pandemics, uh, uh, third and even fourth waves have, have happened uh, almost consistently. Viruses have a particular capability of exchanging uh, genetic material with other viruses. So that, for example, if a swine or a horse or a human uh, gets inf infected with two viruses at the same time, those viruses can exchange genetic information and can, can change their own genetic makeup and become a new virus.